Hands of My Podcast is a proud member of Dark Cast Network, presenting the brightest of indie podcasts. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo, and I bring stories and cases from the people of color community, bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black Indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So, welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. Please stop the tape and flip to side B, Mysterious Death of Buffalo Jim Barrier. Welcome back to the show tonight. We got a real good show tonight. I got everything under control, brother. Uh, I got back the uh, war club from Rooster, Buffalo. What do you think of that? Huh? Give me that. Like I said, brother, I got everything under control. We're going to have a good show tonight. Back to Johnny Psycho Perry and Flash Funk, brother. Buffalo Jim was well known in Las Vegas for winning a protracted legal dispute over parking space with his neighbor and landlord Rick Rizzolo, former owner of the Crazy Horse 2 Gentleman's Club, which was situated next door to Barry's repair business. Rizzolo was compelled by the court to sell the nightclub in order to pay his debts. When the pub failed to sell, the U.S. Marshal Service seized it in September of 2007, forcing its closure. Rizzolo was freed in late March of 2008 after spending about 10 months in a federal prison on racketeering and tax evasion and conviction in a federal court in the United States. Buffalo Jim later had to relocate because of the government, wanting to take over the land. He was already working with the real estate agents to find a new site before his tragic death. My dad was really excited because he was going to move to a new location with his business. It was finally time for him to move out of that like 30 year lease that he was in, that he was locked in, grandfathered in. He was looking for a new location to build his auto repair shop there, wrestling school. And then he had this grand idea to have a section of his business available for me to start a spa. At the time of my dad's death, I owned a skincare clinic in Everett, Washington. So my dad and my sister at the time, one of my sisters was going to cosmetology school to do hair. So my dad said, hey, it's, I'm really excited. We're going to have a family business together. You can move to Vegas now. You can have, we'll have a spa. You'll be the esthetician. At least we'll be the hairstylist. And little Buffalo, Jerrica, is going to run the operation. And so he had this whole idea for me. Um, I, I never did tell him I was committed to that idea, but he was. he had a lot of plans for us all to be together again. Um, so he, yeah. He, yeah, he was always trying to bring us, us family back together because again, I didn't live in Vegas anymore. My mother and I moved to Seattle primarily due to my dad's feud with Rick Rizzolo. It tore our family apart and my mom being that she has family sisters in Seattle, my mother and I and Jerrica in the beginning moved to Seattle in 2001 and, uh, and my mother and I ended up staying there. And Jerrica ended up going back to move with our dad because our dad was committed to supporting her and making sure she was fully taken care of. And my mom agreed to that. So, but my dad had this idea back in 2007, prior to him passing, that we were all gonna be together again and that I was gonna move to Vegas and he was gonna build this business for me. Cause he saw that I was building a business for myself in Everett, Washington. So I was, I was somewhat excited about that. I mean, I, I was focused on my business in Washington state but I was also excited for my dad's ambition to bring us together. I'd like to add a little background to what was going on. Uh, the Buffalo had his auto marine store on the southern end of a strip mall. And then right next to him was the Crazy Horse, which was a gentleman's club. And then north of the Crazy Horse, he had his wrestling school. So he had, he had the two businesses and two things going on there. About 2002, this Rizzolo, who was operating the uh, Crazy Horse, and I'll tell you a little bit about the Crazy Horse right now. The Crazy Horse uh, 
it's been shown that had ties to organized crime and a bunch of other things. And there was stuff happening in there all the time. Uh, I'm sure during this podcast, we'll talk more about that. But uh, about 2002, this Rizzolo through some entity purchased that whole strip mall. It belonged to a company called Schiff at the time. So they purchased that whole thing. And then, and I saw this during the course of litigation, they had plans drawn up that showed the Crazy Horse expanding into Buffalo's Auto Marine store. And they had plans showing, pushing over to where the wrestling school was. I think there was another business between the Crazy Horse and the wrestling school. Uh, the lease for the wrestling school came due and you know there was no attempt to renew it but Buffalo had a pretty long-term uh, lease there. So instead of trying to negotiate with Buffalo at the time, maybe saying, hey, we have plans here, we'll buy you out, you know, help you do this or what have you, they set about a course of action to drive him from those premises. And so what they started doing is, you know, one of the first things, and we had to go to court on this and we beat it, uh, he had a series of 21-year renewable lease options, one-year uh, renewables. And so the first thing they started to do, they came up with phony arguments that the lease, that he failed to renew the lease. So they tried to evict him. We beat that. We were able to show very clearly he had renewed the lease every year. So that went bye-bye. So then they started on a bunch of things to really interfere with his business. So for example, you know, being an auto body, people leave their car overnight because you can't get it fixed in one day, waiting for parts or whatever you're going to do to it. So he would leave the cars outside at night and start, they started getting vandalized. They'd start breaking out windows, key in the cars and different things. They set up some phony tow zones. And so at night they would tow his cars. Uh, they put barriers on front of the entrance to his place. Uh, they started setting up these no parking zones, which they claimed was done by the city. And then they called parking enforcement uh, to come over. And his people would get tickets. Uh, a lot of the cars I said that were parked overnight might might have gotten towed, which would then impact his business because who wants to leave their car, you know, with a business where you got a chance of having the car towed, keyed, or broken into, smashed, or something to that effect. Uh, then he would call for the fire department to uh, uh, Rizlo or one of his cronies would call for the fire department to come in there do inspections on his place, claiming these fire hazards that did not exist. And, you know, just other passive aggressive measures, like they would take the big dumpsters that were outside the crazy horse where they were throwing their bar refuge, their food refuge, and God knows what else into those uh, dumpsters. And then they would move those dumpsters right out to the back door of his business. So the walk in and have the, uh, you know, instead of having the smell of oil and the, the things that you normally would smell in an auto body shop, or an auto repair shop, you'd have that wonderful waif of, of uh, bar refuge, vomit, and a bunch of other things. And so those were the things they undertook. And then as time progressed, there was things happening there. People were getting beat up in the crazy horse. There was one instance with a man by the name, I believe Kirk Henry, ended up a quadriplegic, I believe, from getting beat up in there because mm. his bill wasn't getting paid. Uh, they were drugging people in there, it was alleged that, uh, and they would run up charges on their credit cards that weren't real. And then they tell them you need to either pay or get beat up or something. And and there was all kinds of things. Every morning Buffalo come out, there was needles that he had to clean up, uh, clean up uh, vomit, clean up uh, all kinds of stuff around his place. And so these were the things that were going on. Eventually we ended up in a litigation on this. And as the litigation pr proceeded, uh, there was other things happening. Rizzolo was being criminally charged. Uh, and so we ended up having a million dollar prejudgment writ of attachment against Crazy Horse and whatever other defendant we had in there because Rizzolo was going to go to prison and they were, or he was ordered to divest his interest that the Crazy Horse had to be sold. So that's some more of the background that was going on. Probably a lot of a lot of detail on that that I gave you, but those were the things that were happening. So during this time frame, as we start getting about a couple of years before he he was found in his passing, there was 
threats coming. Uh, there was a lot of threats, verbal threats. Uh, he would get weird notes left in his place. Uh, Cause one of the things that Buffalo is doing at this time, and I can't remember when he started it, you know, in relation to when he passed, but he was collecting information about the crazy horse and providing it to law enforcement. I think he spent tens of thousands of dollars on copy charges because uh, he would come over to my office with boxes. He'd take boxes to the FBI. He had statements, he had pictures. He had a tremendous amount of documentation that what was going on there. And I'm told through some sources that this was very helpful to law enforcement in you know, getting Rizzolo criminally charged, although it seemed more what they ended up doing is the old Al Capone method by getting him on income tax evasion charges. So that's kind of the background of things leading up to what happened on that evening. But um, he was also very concerned for his safety. Um, during that time, uh, Rick Rislow had gone to prison and uh, and he was it was coming close to him getting out of prison. And my dad had, I vividly remember my, my dad telling me that he now had to watch out. And I asked him like, what do you think could happen to you? And he said, it would be done through a stratagem and it would be a setup and there were drugs would be used, women would be used. And that sticks with me today because <laughs> that's very much what happened. And I just, it was a couple of weeks before he passed away when he said that to me, mm. that Rick was getting out of prison. He now had to watch out. That was one of the things that I wanted to ask because I noticed that looking at the articles and other information that Rizzolo was released early April and then by April mm -hmm. 6th, this. My dad um, was my dad was killed that day. Um, yeah. He was dead the next day, found April 5th, was when he went out to go meet a woman named Lisa. He was probably trying to help her because he, he was working actually, anonymous, he was working undercover with Prostitutes Anonymous which probably explains that silver phone in the episode that mm -hmm. we saw. Um, our family never received that phone, nor did we know our dad have having that phone. Um, it wasn't until we requested the investigative files from Metro and the coroner's office while working with Unsolved Mysteries, when they gave, they gave us this file and we were looking through the photographs and we saw that silver phone. Wow. And yeah, so I was wondering like, could it have been that this woman called my dad on that number and my dad went out to rescue her? Right, right. And she was, she set him up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's really, it really all makes sense to me. And I'd like to add a few more facts to the whole thing. Here's put everything in perspective for further discussion on this. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Rizzolo was sentenced to a year in prison for a tax evasion, actually a year and a day. I believe he did about 10 months and then they released him to house arrest. And the day he got off house arrest, it was either the day before or the day of April 5th. That was the day that uh, Buffalo uh, passed. He was found the next day on uh, April 6th of 2008. And there was talk around a lot of circles that this might have been a, you know, this just talk, I'm not asserting this myself, that this might have been a get out of jail present or something. But that same day that Rizlo got out, there was a burglary at the premises uh, of the Auto Marine and broke out, the, got inside there. And there was a uh, piece of paper left on the desk with his, his own residential address on there. With the sign being possibly, you know, we know where you live type of thing. Uh, he had gotten a call uh, I don't know how long before he uh, before that date, the guy alleged that he was a hit man that was going to uh, was going to kill him. Uh, some folks had called him that there was discussions among several folks that they were going to take him out. Uh, he got some notes uh, that you know that he was you know threatening notes they were going after him and the whole like. So Rizzle gets out uh, Buffalo gets contacted by this Lisa allegedly about to, for him to you know, sell Buffalo a motorcycle or something on behalf of a friend. 
and and so Buffalo goes out to meet her. This is Lisa's story about why they they hooked up. Or uh, that's not a term anymore. That used to be a term where you met somebody, but I I probably should say where they met up. Now, interestingly, they end up at this Motel Six, and here's a real difference in testimony between the two women. This first woman that testified, she testified that, you know, they were going to motels all the time, but Buffalo never wanted to be in public. So she went in there, gave her ID and, and paid for the room, et cetera. But all of a sudden now Buffalo's at this motel. He's on video. There's a video showing the exact time when he came in. He comes in, seems okay, seems fine. He gets the room. And I don't remember the time exactly, but it's around 8.30 or somewhere around that time frame. But uh, when they obtained the room entry records uh, later on, somebody had entered that room seven minutes before Buffalo checked in. So some, you know, this is something that's never been fully investigated, never looked at why somebody's going into that room. Now this is eight o'clock at night and it wasn't a maid's key. And it's doubtful any maid was on that time of the night either. Because my understanding is that this room was, he wanted a first floor room and it was no reservation. And that was the only room that was available on the first floor or something. But somebody's in that room seven minutes prior uh, to all this occurring. So that's in itself, should, you know, most normal rational people would look at that and say, here, there's the red flag here. Something's going on right here. And then uh, it was the whole thing like we were talking about, you know, the seizure, you know, he's on his back in pristine condition, not really an indic indicative of a man having a, a seizure. And here's a, something that's really, really important. And it just shows the lack of attention to detail. All the reports claimed that he had this white powdery substance in his beard and on around his mouth and because he as johnny pointed out he had a beard down to his navel uh and he had hair back there mustache and i say this with all affection when you talk to buffalo in the evening sometimes you can see what he had for breakfast that morning but uh it was the uh he's got this white powder all over him do you know they never tested that powder they just said it's cocaine and it was never tested. Now, for the cocaine to be on his beard and on his face, it would have been, he'd have had to have a big bowl and basically just stuck his face in the bowl and, you know, and shook his head around in there, did what he's going to do. Uh, you know, <laughs> who would who would do that? And, you know, one of them talked about how he would lick the baggie or something in their allegations of his drug use. Uh, and then flush a baggie down the toilet. So, I mean, it just defies imagination somebody sticking their whole face in a bowl. Quite frankly, there was no bowl found or there was no traces of cocaine. But the only thing that they alleged was this white powder on his face. In addition, there was indications he had GHB in his system, the uh, date rape drug, mm. which would immobilize him. And it was put out in some of the paperwork. We should test this further. That never gets looked into. Oh. Uh, the, the, I think Jennifer can correct me if I was wrong. They were asking for a hair test to be done. No hair test was to be done to see if there was anything in the system. Uh, but this having it all over his face like that just doesn't make a lick of sense, uh, you know, on somebody. So as you kind of build up the scenario here, it looks like things are, and there's some minor things too, like, for example, I know this, and I know Jennifer can attest to this. Buffalo would, would rather, uh, you know, probably have his fingernails pulled off to drink tap water. It was always bottled water. Yeah. And he would, ne he'll, he would never drink tap water ever. And there was two bought two glasses of tap water, no bottled water in the place there when he got in there. And so there's this is a minor thing, but it just goes to show you that this thing. This is a detail they probably didn't know if this scene was staged. Uh, also, Buffalo, and I saw it many times, carried a wad of cash with him everywhere he went. Uh, and so there was a one dollar was always found on him. One dollar folded over. Uh, there's some 
there's some lore that that could have been a sign of a hit, but the, the more important factor to take out of this, there was no cash found in there. And normally he would have had a bulge in the, you know, in, in, in his clothing somewhere showing that, you know, carrying that cash, there was not a, a bit there. And uh, another thing that was very interesting was he had this big white, I believe it was a Rolls Royce, if memory serves me right. And so when Little Buff showed up, and I think Elise was the other one there, the two sisters, after they got this call, come down here and identify your dad, and having a 16-year-old come over and do that, which is in and of itself inexcusable, they they went to look for the car. Now, the scene of this is a Motel 6. You could probably walk around the parking lot in less than a minute. And his car was nowhere to be found. And they went around it a couple of times just to make sure no car. They talked to a police officer. Police officer said no car. And he starts doing a report about a missing car. Later on that afternoon, the car miraculously shows up in the parking lot. And not only is it there in the parking lot, it's clean. Mm. There's not even a finger, they fingerprint inside it. There's not anything inside it. It's been scrubbed. Now, the interesting thing about it, again, is I say this with great affection, Buffalo had, a, again, a beard down to his navel, a long mustache and hair down to about his butt, very hairy. And we used to joke about it because he came come over to my conference room and we actually had to you know, take and pick up the hair that was left on the chair and the table because he did shed it. And, and there wasn't a single hair in that car. And this is a car he drives in all the time and you don't find a hair off of him. And so you've got all these things with this crime scene that never, that never come to pass uh, on, on this lack of investigation. And these things are, they're glaring. I mean, they're glaring. I mean, an amateur sleuth could figure this out that there that this thing was staged and but they give credibility to two women who give testimony or i would call it testimony a tape statement that builds on the narrative to support what they're trying to say in that room and here's another interesting little fact you know the jennifer and the family commissioned a independent autopsy and the uh, lady would not, who conducted the autopsy, a doctor would not give him the notes and refused to do it, wanted a court order and a bunch of them. This was a private autopsy that was commissioned. And then I believe, uh, Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but the late, uh, this doctor said she doesn't have anything to offer anymore. So can't even go into court and sue her to try to compel, the, compel her to turn over these documents. So I've gone on for quite a while, but I wanted to set the stage a lot more about what was occurring in this matter. And then I'll echo one last comment that Jennifer made. Buffalo told me the same thing, that they would use a woman to get to him. And he told me that about six months earlier. And we had had a discussion that we felt that he was fairly safe because, you know, he was high profile. He was very high profile. Uh, both in what he was doing with his battle with the crazy horse court case, it was in the papers, and plus what he was doing promoting Las Vegas and stuff. So he was a high profile guy. And but he said they'd use a woman and and here we are. And then also, Gus, um, at the scene there was a pill bottle next to the two cups of water. I think it was initially to be portrayed like it was a suicide. My dad wouldn't have brought a pill bottle there. But it was interesting because that pill bottle was dated from like seven or eight years ago. So, and my dad used to bring some heart medication to his office because he would take it one time a day in the afternoon. And that was that medication. And I, I often wonder if like this guy named Dave that worked for my dad was the one that, you know, collected that pill bottle. Also, Dave, that very night my dad's shot was broken into when Rick was released from house arrest. Dave forgot to turn on the alarm at my dad's shop. He was responsible to lock the door and turn on the alarm. And he said he forgot to turn on the alarm. So I remember my dad telling me that he does not trust Dave anymore and that Dave will not pick up his lunch anymore because he just doesn't trust him. Wow. So Dave is a suspect to me. 
just he seems he seems to be yeah i yeah. mean you connect all these dots and you can really see that this was a complete and utter setup yeah. it's so easy to see like gus said like an amateur sleuth can figure this out there was another question i i think we we're kind of leading up to in regards to uh, after Buffalo Jim was discovered in a particular police statement of a woman that had known Buffalo Jim for a short period of time, even though her credibility was questioned and she had constantly changed her story, her interview took priority over a uh, I think her name was Lisa. I can probably bleep that out if I need to. But um, took precedence over another woman who had known Buffalo Jim for a 20 plus years. Um, do you know the story behind as to why they took Lisa's statement as, a pr- as precedence over this other woman's statement in regards to the aftermath? Yeah, I can I can just mention that uh, this so this uh, other woman was was found, um, and she is a woman that my dad had known for 20 years, and in fact our family knows her. And it's just interesting. She had said to me on the phone, she's like Jennifer, I heard a knock on my door, and I answered it. And it was two detectives. Then they invited themselves in, and they started recording an interview with me while we sat in my living room. And I said, do you know why they came over to record you? She like, she said, I don't know why, but they were asking me about your dad. And she's like, I had heard your dad passed away. In fact, I saw it in the news because it had happened a week ago. And she's like, but I don't know why they would have came to my house to interview me. I didn't have anything to do with your dad's death. Then the very next day is when they interviewed Lisa, the woman that was with my dad that night and her statement to police, first of all, she lies and gives two different scenarios. First, she said, my dad went to the bathroom and she left the room. Doesn't know if she shut the door or not. Then she's interviewed by a second violent crimes detective. She tells him a completely different story and says that my dad started convulsing and going into a seizure because he was snorting, after snorting mass amounts of cocaine, she didn't know if he was gonna die or not. So she left the room and doesn't know if she shut the door or not. Well, that story became the official story. But what's interesting is while I was reading those transcripts, her story corroborates with with the other woman's story, the woman that my dad actually knew. And it's interesting to me because I'm led to believe that Lisa didn't know my dad very long. And why would the police go to this other woman's house, a woman who had history with my dad and interview her? And then the next day interview Lisa. There's no reason to interview the other woman. Anyway, I think Gus can, uh, you know, mention more about this, but it just, (laughs) it seems like they're trying to create some sort of narrative. There's no reason to interview the other woman unless you need a story. Right. And I'll follow up on that with those two stories of these two women. The crime scene, or I'm going to call it a crime scene, (laughs) was clearly staged. You know, it's just because if you look at the evidence, you look at the statements, but the interviews with these two women that took place, I think one on about April 14th and then Lisa on the 15th, it seemed like these interviews were conducted to support and conform the crime scene to their narrative. Uh, because the the narrative that is that was pushed as to the cause of death of Buffalo was you know, cocaine uh, induced, uh, for lack of a better term, cocaine induced uh, cardiac arrest, some, that, something to that effect. But they had to make they had to make the narrative fit. And so they used these two women. And I'll follow up with what Jennifer said about the first woman. She had nothing to do with this, but they showed up on her doorstep. Yes, she had knew the family, but there were quite a few others that knew the family real well, Johnny. Uh, a bunch of others uh, that knew the family well. They didn't show up to their doorstep to talk to them. So it's suspect that this lady even gets a visit because she's not even remotely in the picture for any of this. And in her interview, it seems like she's trying to set the background for what occurred in that motel room that night. 
And then this Lisa gal gives so much conflicting testimony to even look at her as credible on this. And I'll address that a little bit more in a second is mind boggling to me because she's all over the map on what she's saying and different things. You know, for example, one thing she said is that he was doing all kinds of cocaine. She went into the bathroom and because he was doing the cocaine, she left. Then in another testimony or another portion of testimony, she says he was having a seizure. So she did what everybody else would do that allegedly was a friend of a guy like Buffalo having a seizure, just leave the room, let him continue with his seizure. Does that make even a remote amount of sense that someone's having a seizure and you just walk out of the room, don't even know if you close the door or not. And in regards to that seizure, when the, uh, the, when they looked at it the next morning, he's on his back. He's got uh, pillows underneath him. His arms are at his side. The bed's immaculate. And quite frankly, you know, I'm no medical expert. I am a lawyer, but it, common sense would dictate that if you're having a seizure, that uh, that room, that bed's going to look a mess. And so those are some of the things here. But this woman's story makes no sense whatsoever as to what happened. But for some reason, you know, the, the crime scene itself was not taped off. They handed it back to the motel a few hours after it was found. Uh, and I'll address some of the, the, the anomalies and the strangeness of this investigation. But they grasped onto this cocaine thing and said, well, accidental death or, you know, it was because he was doing the cocaine and those are things. No follow through. Uh, if this constitutes their investigation, talking to these two women, that alone is deficient. Uh, we've tried several times to get some law enforcement interested in this. And I've reached out to some folks to, you know, to look at the investigation and a couple of them come back to me and said, this is this is insane. You know, there there was so many missteps in the investigation, and I would probably be more appropriate to say lack of investigation uh, and not even refer to it as an investigation. Uh, so the, the, the two statements in answer to your question, I have none of us have any earthly idea why these two women were allowed to or interview. Well, I, don't, I don't understand why the first one was interviewed. I can see why this Lisa was interviewed, but to take their versions and accept that as the the cause and pretty well in their non-investigation uh, is preposterous to you, mm. at least. 100%. 100%. That was just the most unorganized investigation, just throwing, grabbing things from the air suspects that had nothing to do with the, the time of death um and johnny did they even you know when was the last time that you were able to speak with buffalo jim i would say it had been about three days that's what memory sticks in my mind that i hadn't heard from buffalo <clears throat> and that didn't take place um because we talked all the time. He liked to talk about how healthy he was now, how clean a living he is now, because he knew that would make me proud. And then, like I said, I'd say, to my memory, three days went by without hearing from him. And that was strange. And then all of a sudden, phone. Uh, one of Buffalo's daughters said, um, out of respect, I'm not going to say, well, she said, dad's dead. But, you know, that was a private personal conversation at the time. Mm -hmm. But just basically that Buffalo was gone. And so now after hearing Gus, you hear Jennifer a little bit, you can see why Jen, her sisters have all the, you know, pain still from wanting just decency for their father, their hero, you know, and, and Gus is more than just a business side. Obviously he's a, he's a friend, family, and uh, uh, you know, upstander for him too in business. But um, you know, that's why Jen 
after 15 years is his, and I've known Captain Jen has kept in communication. I'm grateful for that with me over the last 15 years. She's as passionate and um, she's as passionate about it today as she was uh, 15 years ago. And um, I know that Buffalo, as I've said many times to Jen, would, would, would want you. And I hope when we're done here talking today, you're maybe take a couple hours after that you're happy, you have a beautiful family, but um, I think anybody listening to what you and Gus just said could understand why you want credible justice, some integrity done right. for your father and for your hero. Yeah. So there was a guy that would come into my dad's shop often, often meaning about once or twice a week. Um, this guy was not homeless, didn't look homeless at least. And he would just want to hang out in my dad's lounge. So my dad would allow him to do that, but he would have him do some sort of task for him, like fold newspapers or clean up the lounge or wash the windows. And after I saw him twice, I had asked my dad who this person was. My dad told me to come into his office and shut the door. He had told me that he believed this guy was a spy. And my immediate response was, well, why do you have this guy here then? Kick him out. His response was, you keep your friends close, your enemies closer. I put him to work when he comes in. So um, I, I found it interesting that this guy would want to come to my dad's shop. There would be no other reason for him to want to just hang out in the lounge for several hours. And I can see how this could be a spy because think about it, like people that are coming into my dad's shop, this guy would be able to see and hear all those conversations. Um, but uh, I did give his name to the detectives after my dad passed away because I found him to be a suspicious person that should be looked into. And of course, the detectives never looked into this guy. And I want to add something about Buffalo's character here that's been kind of in tune with some of the, with the reports. And then I think Johnny can attest to this. For Buffalo to be doing cocaine would have been out of character. Uh, he did confide into me that he did have co used cocaine back, I think it was in the 80s or 90s, uh, that he it confided in me that he did have a little bit of a problem with it, and he beat it. And he was proud of that, that he beat it. And and it, it would have been something, of the Buffalo that I knew personally, that would have been so out of character, so out of whack to have a cocaine issue or to be using cocaine that was... Uh, in, you know that the way these ladies portrayed it in their recorded statements uh, made zero zero sense. Uh, if you knew Buffalo, uh, it didn't jive at all. Yeah, and the, and and partly the reason why, actually, the reason why I requested the hair sample was to prove that he wasn't a drug user because you would be able to tell through that sample. And I was promised by Detective Mark Harding that he was going to get that hair sample. And then I followed up with him two times before our dad was buried. He said he's getting the hair sample. Then our dad got, was buried. A few days later, I'm like, hey, I wonder if he, what's the status of the hair sample? I called him and he said they never took it. And then he blamed the coroner's office. And then I went to the coroner and the coroners blamed Metro. They were blaming each other constantly. Well, Metro's saying there's no investigation, so there's nothing for us to do here. And then Metro was saying, well, the coroner didn't think that there was anything there in the autopsy, so there's no reason to get the hair sample. They were constantly blaming each other, like playing this good cop, bad cop game. Mm. It's one of those, I don't know if you can see it on the video, they went that away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what they were doing. And I was so frustrated. I mean, I was only 24 at the time. I had a business in Seattle, Everett, Washington. I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, me personally. And then I, I had my sisters leaning on my shoulder, just trying to say like, trying to trying to get me to help them too, like to provide answers for our family. And I just didn't know who to trust, where to go. I mean, the treatment that was being done to us just seemed so poor. I, I felt like I was being played with by the detectives. There was one guy that was a, a sergeant um, that was part of the um, domestic violence unit, Sergeant John Scott. And then there was Detective Mark Harding and Detective Ivy that were part of the Violent Crimes Unit, which I always thought was weird because my dad died. Why is the Violent Crimes Unit and why is this domestic violence sergeant involved in this case? 
But the, the, the sergeant from domestic violence was the bad cop. He was always yelling at me. He told me to take his job and he would say, you don't know all the details. Your dad's not going to tell you things that he does. He's not going to tell you. You're just a disgruntled daughter. And I'm like, no, I just want answers. Stop yelling at me. And then Detective Mark Harding and Detective Ivy were like the good cops. Oh, Jennifer, we'll get the hair sample. Oh, Jennifer, I understand your sentiment. Oh, I understand your family. We're going to get answers for you. This, this warrants a full investigation. Those were things that were being said to me. So I didn't know what to believe. I'm being told one thing and other things are happening. Then did, um, uh, Coroner Mike Murphy, that guy was the worst. He would constantly yell and he was frustrated because I don't think anyone thought that his daughter was going to get this far. Seriously, I, I think that they underestimated me, but I'm like, you know, and then I had said once to corner Mike Murphy, I said, do you have kids? I says, I hope one day your daughter would stand up for you. I said, my dad was murdered and I want answers. And he would just listen. He, and sometimes he would fight back and say some things. He was very known to like aggressively write on paper. He would always have a notebook with him. And when I would say things, he would start writing on paper where the paper would tear because he was writing so aggressively because he was so mad that I was saying something. Just bad experience with these officials. Poor experience I had. I just, I don't know who to believe anymore. But will I ever give up on my dad? No. No. I would hope he would, I would hope my kids would never give up on me. So um, it was like three days after my dad passed away, I knew he was going to be buried soon. It was important for me and my sisters to get a second opinion regarding the autopsy. At the time, we didn't know who to hire. I was told to call the coroner's office to see if they had a recommendation, so I did. They referred me to Dr. Rexine Orell. I gave her a call, explained my father's passing. Um, I discussed with her the circumstances surrounding his death. I firmly stated that our family believes there was foul play involved and that our dad was murdered. And she said, fine, I can do the autopsy. Go ahead and deliver $3,000 in cash to the Palm Mortuary. And once it's received, they'll let me know and I'll go in and do that autopsy. After my autopsy, I will make sure that I get you a, a written report. Along with that written re report, you'll receive any photos, audio, video that I take. And um, that will be ready within the first, within a two week period time. Well, two weeks went by, I hadn't heard from her. Four weeks went by, nothing from her. So I gave her a call and had called numerous times and no answer. I stopped off at a pay phone and called and she did answer. I had asked her if we can receive, if we can please get the report. And she said, why do you want to see your dad's dead body? I'm not giving you the, any photos or any report. I'm holding my work in case I'm held in contempt of court. And I was in shock. I had paid her $3,000, hired her independently to conduct this autopsy. Now she's denying me access to the report. I had mentioned this to the detectives because I found her to be suspicious and wanted to see if they would interview her. Of course, they did not interview her. Well, fast forward to the year 2020. While working with Unsolved Mysteries, um, it was important for me to obtain the records from both the Metropolitan Police Department and the coroner's office. So I hired an attorney to request those documents. They say uh, we were able to obtain the, uh, the records and while we're looking through the coroner's reports, I saw the report from Rexine Worrell. So she submitted a report to the coroner's office but would not give me or my sisters a report. Well, in her report, she had sent um, some brain tissue, a brain tissue sample to, to a, a laboratory um, for results. And that result came back with um, there being 1,928 nanograms per grams of cocaine in my dad's brain tissue. Only 228 nanograms per gram um, metabolized. I was in shock when I saw that number. 1,928 nanograms per gram of, brain, of cocaine in his brain tissue? You would think that would trigger some sort of investigation. We're stating that our dad had told us that it would be made to look like he died of a drug overdose. So if he was drugged, this would make sense. 
that is a large amount of cocaine in his brain tissue. And the fact that um, Dr. Larry Sims placed the time of his death between 7 and 9 p.m. He was seen checking in at 822. How could that much cocaine get in his brain tissue in within 40 minutes? That should have been looked into. Uh, I was very suspicious of Roxanne Morrell. Um, roughly two years after my dad passed away, I emailed her to see if maybe she would give me the reports and video, audio, anything that she had. And she had written me back and said that her hard drive crashed and she no longer has reports from 2000, I think it was 2007 to 2010 when my dad passed away in 2008. So her excuse was the hard drive crash. Now she no longer has anything. This is a woman that needs to be looked into and certainly not a trusted medical professional should anyone should hire. It's very unfortunate that she led us astray. She took our money and she did not uh, do what she said she was going to do. And again, she is someone on my list that's a very highly suspicious person. That's outrageous. Um, yeah. And then also it was um, about two and a half months after my dad passed away. I was looking at the autopsy report from the coroner's office and I saw that Dr. Jess Evans from Quest Diagnostics was the one who ran the toxicology. Mm -hmm. um, so I called him and I wanted to see if I can get a meeting with him. And he said, yes, come in tomorrow at 9 a.m. So I went to visit him at the Quest Diagnostics on Charleston and he, I sat in his office, he started welling up in tears and told me if I subpoenaed him, he would talk. And I'm like, okay, so you must know something then. And he's like, if you subpoena me, I'll talk. I'll, Cause I gave him the whole background story about my dad. I showed him newspaper clippings of my dad's feud. I showed him some court um, documents that I had from Gus and he just wouldn't tell me anything. He said he needed to be subpoenaed. So then that very day, I drove to the coroner's office and demanded to talk to coroner Mike Murphy. Coroner came out and I told him he was lying to me and my sisters. Dr. Evans wants to be subpoenaed. Then he had me go into his office and he started yelling at me, reprimanding me. He said, the Quest Diagnostics is their client. I'm not supposed to be going to the, their clients and talking without authorization. He said, like, if he told you that, he must have told you that wrongfully because he, he's not supposed to talk to our clients. So he's like, they're a client to us. You're a client, you're, you guys are a family. They're not supposed to be talking to you. And then I get called into the coroner's office a couple of weeks later, me and Jessica went and Je Dr. Evans came into the room. It was like a movie. We were sitting in an office with like a whole bunch of people, like Metro officers were there. The coroner's people were there, who knows who they were. Coroner Mike Murphy, his assistant and a few others. And then all of a sudden the door opens and Dr. Evans comes in and he sits down and he said, Hey, when I met with you a few weeks ago, I made a mistake. I don't need to be subpoenaed. <laughs> and I just got up and left and I never went back to the coroner's office since. So like, I mean, wow. I knew that like, come on, does that not reek a setup? Why would he say this to me? Why would a PhD tell me he wanted to be subpoenaed and lead me astray if that's not true? If there was nothing there, then he should have said, I'm sorry for what happened to your dad. I don't have anything for you. He didn't right. need to tell me I needed to be subpoenaed. He must know something. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, it's, it, it, it really reeks. It's to go through because like, I, didn't tr I don't know who to trust anymore. Mm -hmm. These are professional people that I'm supposed to believe in, to do the right thing. Absolutely. We were totally led astray. This is why 15 years later, I'm still like, I want to know what happened to my dad. I, I should know. I feel like we have the right to know. Mm -hmm. If they can do this to me, they can do this to anyone else. Jennifer, I am so sorry that you are going through this. I'm so numb to it now. I can't even shed a tear. In the beginning, it was so heart wrenching because my sisters really leaned on me to get them answers. And I promised them I would. I remember I had said in the Unsolved Mysteries program, I remember sitting around at our dining room table and my sister Elise saying, Jennifer, dad was set up. What are we going to do? Is anything going to get done? Is anyone going to help us? And I said, I will find out and I will try to get something done. And I've, I've been on that quest since that day, since our dad was murdered. 
and nothing. I just can't get anyone to budge. I've contacted the FBI several times since the show launched and nothing. I just don't know who to trust anymore. I've, I've lost trust in our system. Thank you, Jennifer, Johnny, Gus, um, sharing the stories about Buffalo Jim, who he really is. Um, I love that. I love, it just feels like I, I missed out on an opportunity to meet him in person. Um, I guess in closing, what would you like to get out of this podcast? What is your goal? Because I would love to share any links, any resources. What would you like to get from this um, podcast that I'm able to provide to the listeners? Just the additional exposure. You, you were the you were the first person to reach out to me to want me to be on your podcast. There's been a few others. I haven't done those podcasts yet. I haven't decided on those yet. But I really appreciate the fact that you watched the show and you really took time to reach out to our family. And I really appreciate, I truly appreciate you for that. And just whatever you can do to get this out to your network so that people can see like the story really exists. Like these things do happen to good people. They do. Thank you, Jennifer. I can make just two quick comments. Um, yes, sir. Like, like you said, you, you, you missed out on meeting the man. We're all a little somber right now. But let's go back who the man was. Uh, you missed out. I mean, if you met him, you would have never forgot him. Big, huge, fun, loving, loyal, strong, dedicated. And uh, yeah, as Gus said, it, he was in better shape at the very end than he was for the last several years. Uh, just through him starting to do a little bit of walking, he was eating better, he, he wasn't drinking, no drugs. Uh, that's what he was telling me. And every time I saw him, that's what it showed me because he looked he looked really good. Closure for his family, his daughters, if that can ever take place. So respect a life involved that people respect and follow through but keeping the memory alive of, of, of uh, one of the most colorful characters most jubilant people most giving people in Las Vegas officially voted a couple times around the world I still like to uh, I have his picture right over here you know watch video or something like they showed on Netflix and I go, it's Buffalo, <laughs> it's Buffalo, it's Buffalo Jim. And when he come out in the back locker room, it lit up. He come into a room, it lit up. Deserves more. He does. And Jen, um, you know, and he'd always say, I just want my girls to be safe, happy and successful. Hopefully they can be happy. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you. Thank you. Was... Thank you for your time today. We re really appreciate it. Uh, the more exposure and continued exposure on this, the more apt that someday there will be closure on this matter. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Gus. Thank you so much. You know, it, this was an, I could just tell the vibe on this podcast, Jasmine, from you was very professional very heartfelt and very, very serious. You know, if there's a word that encompasses professional, serious and heartfelt human, plug that word in because we, that was, that was really nice, Jasmine. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. So I appreciate your time out of the day to of express some beautiful stories about Buffalo Gem and um, I can't wait to share with the rest of the world because I know that they will be the same amount of admiration um, for this for this wonderful man who had graced your lives and graced this world. The family and friends of Barrier have been vocal advocates for a comprehensive and unbiased inquiry into the case. 
They have tirelessly campaigned for law enforcement agencies to review the evidence with renewed scrutiny and explore any potential leads that may have been overlooked. In the Netflix show Unsolved Mysteries, provides a valuable platform for his case to reach a wide audience. The importance of ongoing investigations and enduring quest for truth and justice in the case of James Christopher Buffalo Jim Barrier's death cannot be overstated. Such investigations play a vital role in not only seeking justice for Buffalo Jim, but also in upholding the integrity of the legal system and providing closure for the loved ones left behind. The legacy of Buffalo Jim Barrier's case goes beyond the search for answers. It shines a light on the importance of transparency, accountability, and continuous improvement in our investigative processes. It reminds us that behind every unsolved mystery, there are real people yearning for closure and the truth. The pain and determination of Barrier's daughters, family, and friends resonate deeply fueling a need for change and a renewed commitment to resolving these mysteries. May their voices continue to be heard. May their quest for justice be realized. And may the memory of Buffalo Jim Barrier live on as a reminder of the work that remains to be done. If you have any information regarding the death of James Christopher Buffalo Jim Barrier, please contact Jennifer Barrier at www.buffalojimbarrier.com. You're just seeing the tip of the iceberg, brother. If you enjoy our show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcast, And be sure to come back next week for our discussion of true crime stories. Until then, this is Jasmine Castillo. We are voiceless no more. This podcast was created, produced, recorded, and edited by Jasmine Castillo. Researched by Debbie Babalola and Jasmine Castillo. Current active member of Dark Cast Network, Transto Task Force, Uncovered.com, and partners with Search and Support San Antonio.